Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. It's Wednesday, so you know what that means. It's time for another midweek mini mail call. We're actually up to number 32, which is kind of amazing. I know I say that every single time, but it still amazes me all the amazing things that my viewers send in. Uh, again, these are packages I opened in 2021, this year, but they're stuff that was sent in last year. In fact, uh, I think some of these were from November and some from December in this particular video. It's kind of a bit of a hodgepodge. Anyhow, hopefully there's some interesting stuff in here. So without further ado, let's get right to it. All right, we have a package here, a little priority mail package. This comes from Stuart in Kentucky. Not the same Stuart who sent the Apple II in and the uh, other things like the memory tree and stuff like that. Different Stuart, S-T-U-A-R-T, the other spelling. And it's Kentucky in here in the United States. Hi to all my viewers from Kentucky. Oh, that's very interesting. So I think I know, I've heard of these. His note says, Dear Adrian, back in the early 90s, RAM was very expensive. When manufacturers switched from 30 pin sticks to 70 pin, it was very hard to make that transition because you might've had a bunch of RAM left over, kind of like I do. I remember just having enough memory for my new motherboard and processor, but products like these allowed you to use your old 30 pin memory until you could afford the new 70 pin, 72 pin. So what this is, is it's 72 pin connection right here, and it has four 8-bit 30 pin memory slots. And right, so each 72 pin SIM is 32 bits wide, you know, for the processors that were coming out at that time, there were 32 bits. And uh, the old memory was only eight bits wide. So you did need four at a time on like say a 486 or a 386. But uh, with these, you could take four, pop it into this adapter, plug this in your motherboard, and you would be able to reuse that old RAM. So with four of these 30 pins, you would get a total of uh, four megabytes. So yeah, these were kind of like a stopgap measure. Now one is uh, like this, specifically so you could put them together because a lot of times the SIM sockets were pretty close together on the motherboard. So to get them both in here with two adapters, you'd have to be able to, they had to be offset like this. So uh, that's interesting. Okay, so, and there's a little bit more in here. He says, notice these are tiered to fit side by side. Okay, so just like what I said, computer cases were all big back then to accommodate the extra height. So that was never a problem. Not practical now, but you might be interested to talk about this on your show. Keep up the good work. Thank you very much, Stuart. He says, PS, if you need some 30 pin RAM, I can send you some. Well, Rammy says, thank you, but no thank you. Rami is totally full of memory right now, so we're all good. So let's take a look at this stuff uh, on the bench. All right, so check out the Simverters from Stuart. These are just very interesting devices. I, obviously, it's a creative solution to the problem that when you upgraded your computer and you happen to say have a bunch of 30 pin memory that you couldn't use it on your fancy new motherboard that only had 72 pin slots. So what are you gonna do, throw it away? No, of course not. You'll get some Simverters. Now, it's nice that Stuart sent two of these because a machine like this, this is a Pentium motherboard that's right here I'm tapping, it has a 64-bit wide data path to the RAM. Each 72-pin memory module is 32 bits wide. So on a 46, I think you could probably install just one of these, but most 46 motherboards, at least that I've run into, use 30-pin memory like this. It would need four at a time, 32 bits wide, but if you were gonna use these on a Pentium, you would need eight at a time. So two of these Simverters are necessary. And because they are staggered like this, it means that even when your SIM sockets are close together, you can still install eight modules. So I happen to have eight one meg modules here. Let me install these in here and let's see if these things still work. I am giving them kudos for using SIM sockets with metal clips. Thank you very much. That's better than a lot of computer manufacturers did, like Apple. Now this thing is completely passive, so there's really nothing to say that this thing uh, won't work still. But notice here, look at this. See these here? 
These are for the, the select lines that tell the motherboard what kind of RAM you have installed because there are, you do have to tell the motherboard on 72 pin SIMs, maybe not all the time, but you might have to install little bridges on here uh, with the appropriate signaling to tell it that they this, say this is 70 nanosecond, one megabyte or four megabytes of RAM, for instance, something like that. So we'll try it without and see if I have to go and find something to bridge these. Both of these are populated with one megabyte SIM, so this would be a total of eight megabytes. Now I did print out this a while ago, I had it stuck on the wall. This is the sense to tech stuff, so there are four connections there for the four little pads that are on here. And it, S is short, O is open, and right now these are configured for all open, right? And according to this, all open, 60 nanosecond, eight megabytes of RAM. Really, it should be something like this, short, short, open, short for four megabytes, which is one meg times 36. Well, it's actually times 32 because these aren't parity. Oh no, these are parity, what am I saying? There are three chips per. Um, but anyhow, uh, 80 nanoseconds, I think these are a combination of some are 70, and some, oh, that has 60 on it. So it's sort of a hodgepodge. So it would probably be best just to kind of go with either 70 or 80 just to be safe. So let me just try it as is and see what happens. I have my handy dandy test bench here. I took the RAM out of it already. It's a Pentium uh, 133, I think, as I mentioned. And let me figure out the right way to install these. Okay, so this one should go first because it's obviously the lowest profile. There we go. Nope, that did not work. Okay, they had them in backwards. There we go. That is in correctly, except um, I put the wrong one in. I have to put the tall one in first. Now, as Stuart had mentioned in his letter, because this goes inside a PC case, it's tall and it can easily accommodate these large modules. Obviously, if you tried to use it, say, in an Amiga or a Mac, it's a good chance it wouldn't work. But there it is. Both of those are installed just fine. Let's see what happens when I power this computer up. And here we go. <laughs> that would be the unhappy sound. So the memory that I took out of this computer is this one right here. And this is a four megabyte module and it has short, 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 open. And looking at the chart here, short, 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 open is 70 nanosecond, four megabytes, which is what this is. I see 60 and 70 nanosecond chips on here. So I need to replicate that onto here. Okay, so let me figure out how to do that. All right, I used a little wire to go from ground and I made it short, short, open, short on both of these, which results in 80 nanoseconds, uh, four megabytes according to the chart. All right, Simverters are back in the motherboard. Is this gonna work? Here we go. If you hear that beep, it's not working. Oh. And in case anyone is wondering, these first two Sims are bank zero. It says it right here on the motherboard and these two are bank one. So you gotta put two at a time to get bank zero. I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try one SIM inverter and one regular memory module, see if that makes it work a little better. Well, it's not beeping, so that's a good sign. Maybe, maybe not. All right, that came up with eight megabytes. So maybe one of the modules is bad on here. So I just, <laughs> let me swap these out. The ones that are in the motherboard here, are, all four are the same and it did come right up, so excellent. Okay, all matching Gold Star memory is in here now. It's still one megabyte, so there's no capacity difference. Let's take out this RAM. These sockets are very hard to get out without kind of messing up your fingernails. And let's try one more time. Oh, it's still not working. I don't get it. All right, so something is the matter with this sim further. Now I didn't switch all four of the memory modules. I only switched two of these. Could well be that the two that were on here or one of the two is bad. So let me just pop these all off. Try another set. You know, I should have paid more attention to which were the, the ones that I left on there. I put four different memory modules on here. I'll just try one of these uh, uh, Samsung, no, Gold Star ones at a time till I figure out which one's bad. All right, so I tried it with this gold star one in there. It beeped. I put in a different one and it's it's up and it shows eight megs. So I think that means X. I'm just gonna draw an X on there. And let me just quickly test these other two. Uh, this one seems to work. And let's try the last one. Yep, this one seems to work too. So it was just this single bad 
Gold Star Memory Module. I'll just draw some X's on this thing because it's, I don't want to put that back into my stash of parts. X, X. I'd say for the final test, let me pop in the, the large inverter and we'll have both of these running this machine simultaneously for a total of eight megs of RAM. <laughs> it's a little funny looking because the memory sticks out at a strange angle. Yeah, it's working. So this one here goes into the e-waste bin. Eight megabytes of RAM, sweet. So very cool. Thank you, Stuart, for setting these in. These are definitely an interesting little part of history, something that existed for a short period of time and then just disappeared as people bought new RAM. I wonder if there are other RAM adapters that were ever made, like perhaps a way to use uh, so dim, like the laptop style memory in a regular motherboard and that take the, uh, the full size SIMs or DIMMs as they're called, or perhaps someone made a 30 pin memory module that could have sockets on it that could take standard uh, dips, you know, DRAM type chips. This is pretty cool and this does work. I'm not quite sure about installing more than two at a time. I don't think that would work. Definitely wouldn't clear anymore, but at least you could use four of your sticks in your new fancy motherboard. Thanks very much, Stuart. All right, we have a package here. This one comes from Balancing Act Design, Cincinnati, Ohio. Hi to all my viewers in Ohio. Let's see what's in here, it's pretty light. Okay, we got a note and some interesting things here. Let's see what the note says. Hi Adrian, I recently ordered a couple PC Junior cartridge shells and was accidentally sent these M0100 mouse adapters for the Apple IIc. The seller told me to keep the adapters and I don't have a 2C, so I thought I'd donate them to you in hopes you can use them or pass them along to someone in need. FYI, the seller has recently made quite a few contributions to the PC Junior community with development of a DIY cartridge kit and an awesome SD cart for the Junior. I recommend you check these out. I'll put a link in the description to that, of course. As you probably figured out by now, I am a PC Junior fanatic. <laughs> so it is with great respect that I ask you to please move the reset button out of your PC Junior's cartridge slot. <laughs> and if you guys remember that, um, I added a reset button to my PC Junior and I put it in the cartridge slot, which means you cannot use a cartridge on that cartridge slot. There are two slots and I think it's on the right one. I haven't used that machine in a little bit of time. Uh, but yeah, you can't use a cartridge. And um, I actually do have a cartridge now. Dave Just Dave, a friend of mine, gave me a basic cart maybe, something like that for it. Um, and I haven't actually tested it, but uh, I think you can use it in either cartridge slot. I'm, I'm not totally sure. But yeah, I added the reset button there. It wasn't permanent. I can easily take it out. It didn't, I just drilled a small hole on the side of the cartridge slot. But uh, I know PC Junior fans weren't happy that I did that. Although um, I do have to ask, and Scott, it's from this is from Scott, by the way. Thank you, Scott. Um, maybe you can tell me what's a good place to put the reset button on the PC Junior, if not the cartridge slot. I don't want to drill a hole in the case somewhere, but I really want a reset button. I I love having that. So what would be a good spot? I think about it now. I, I guess I could put it on the little. There's a plate on the back where I have the Pico ATX power input and that's 3D printed. I could probably drill a hole in that. Anyhow, yeah, if you have a, a suggestion, Scott, please let me know. But yes, very cool on these adapters. Um, I do have an Apple IIc, and let's just open one of these. What does it mean to be a mouse adapter exactly? I don't know. Well, it's got a nine pin connector on both sides. So I have a feeling what this does is there are certain Macintosh mice some Mac mice work from the original Mac, like the Mac 128 through the Mac Plus, same connector. I have a few of those mice because I have a few of those machines and some of the mice work perfectly well on the Apple IIc, but other ones don't. And they both say M100 on the bottom. I don't know what the difference is, but some of them don't do anything at all while the other ones work flawlessly. So I'm assuming what these adapters do is they allow you to use the standard Mac mouse that doesn't work and make it work. So we'll have to try that because I definitely have Apple IIc's. So let's check this stuff out on the bench. All right, for testing these M100 adapters for the IIc, I'm gonna need, well, an Apple IIc. So there's my test Apple IIc. And with the IIc, I always use this 12 volt DC power supply with a little pigtail that I made right here. It's just a DC barrel jack input to the DIN connector that goes into the back of the IIc. 
And yes, in case anyone's interested, this is just a normal 12 volt DC power supply. And this works perfectly fine on the Apple IIc. You don't have to use whatever AC voltage the original power supply is. Inside the 2C is a little switching power supply and yeah, it just takes that AC voltage that you normally give it, rectifies it and converts it into the various voltages that this thing uses. In fact, watch, there we go. Boots up, turns on just fine. I'm also gonna need a mouse to test with. So this right here is an M100 mouse, it says model M0100. And this is from an original Macintosh, like a Mac Plus or 128 or 512. Some of these work perfectly on the 2C. You don't even have to do anything. You just plug it in to the mouse port, which is right here, and it works. Other ones don't. I'm pretty sure that this one is one of the ones that totally works. You cannot tell by looking at the bottom of the mouse if this is one that works. I wrote Apple 2C on here, actually, because, yeah, I tested this and it, it absolutely works already. So you don't need any kind of adapters. But I do have one, which I'll have to find, which definitely will not work on this machine. So first, let's just get this working, make sure it's working. One piece of software that I loved as a kid was Dazzle Draw, And this is a paint program for the 2C, also the 2E and the 2GS but it uses double high res color graphics. So when I was a kid and I saw double high res, I was like, what, that looks so cool. Here it is, oh, there it is. There's that cool splash screen. So I can click the button. We hit enter to go to Dazzle Draw and this mouse will work. And there is Dazzle Draw. So yep, you can paint, hello, in a full 16 colors. So anyhow, that is that is the paint program. And as you see, this M0100 mouse is working perfectly without any adapter at all. All right, so this was the first one I tested that worked. I wrote, this is the one that has Apple IIc written on there, M0100. And then this one, which is also M0100, I also have Apple II on there because this one works. And this one is M0100, it has little Teflon pads. This one works. So all three of these work perfectly. But I have one more classic Apple mouse, and it's this one, which is a platinum one. And this one, also labeled M0100, I had written at one point, no APL2, because this one doesn't work. Now it says M0100, just like the other ones, but something is clearly different in this. This mouse works perfectly on a Macintosh, just not on an Apple IIc. So if I plug this mouse into the computer, and I try to move the mouse pointer, it just kind of goes, that's down here right now, and it's, I'm not even touching it and look, it's moving by itself. So it's clearly not compatible. And I don't know what's different, but something is obviously not compatible. And my assumption is, is that one of these adapters will make this incompatible mouse compatible. Now on the adapter here, it says mouse and Apple IIc. And I assume this works on the Apple IIe as well that has the mouse card and it has the correct connectors on there to make that happen. Let's give this a try. Plug the mouse into the connector there and hook this up to the back of the machine. Kind of hangs off. It now sticks out kind of at a, not extreme angle, but I wish it weren't quite so big. All right, turn this on. Incidentally, if you're wondering why I have all these Mac, Mac mice for the old classic Macs, it's because I have a 128, 512, and Mac Plus, and I have another Mac Plus. So I have four of those classic Macintoshes, hence the need for four mice. And honestly, one of these, I always use the Apple IIc anyways. And look at that, it does work now. This is fantastic. This is kind of cool. I actually always wanted to use the Platinum one with the 2C because it's a bit more matching of the color. It's not exactly right because it's a bit more gray, but it certainly is a little closer than these brown ones, or I don't know, beige, I guess, than the snow white on the 2C. But how cool, this totally, totally works. That's neat. I really, if anyone knows exactly what's the difference between these mice that work and these that don't, and what this adapter is doing exactly, that allows these incompatible ones to be compatible, please let me know in the comment section below. I'll be really curious. I really love these adapters. Thank you, Scott, for sending in this awesome little adapter. I, I'm This is cool. Okay, so we have a heavy package here. Uh, this one is Priority Mail. And what's cool about Priority Mail is if you can fit it in a box like this, it's a flat rate. So this is pretty heavy, which would normally cost a ton to ship, but uh, it's from Matt in Mississippi and he has packed it in here. <laughs> so let's let's rip this open and uh, see what he has stuffed in this box. Okay, so there is a note here. 
and something heavy. And there's something here. So I don't want to accidentally throw this away without finding everything that's in here. Packing material. All right, looks like we have a hard drive and it's for the classic Macintosh series. So it's a CMS brand drive. And this is the perfect size to sit under your Mac Classic, Mac Plus, or any of those original Macs that had a SCSI connector on them. This was a way to add a hard drive to them, especially for the Mac Plus, because it did not have an internal hard drive. It only had external. Um, before I get to the note, let's just check out what he has in this little padded envelope here. For a second, I thought this might be some RAM. So I'd, get, I'd have to get RAMI out, but no RAMI, nope. Because uh, we got a little um, IDE laptop style hard drive from Apple Computer. Oh, this actually might be SCSI, not IDE. Let's, let's see what he says in his note. He goes, Dear Adrian, I'm sending you this package the day after Thanksgiving, which is the end of November here in the US. Uh, but I, I know you won't be opening until probably after Christmas. So Merry Christmas. <laughs> Boy, uh, you really knew, you know me well, <laughs> because it's the 1st of January while I'm opening this. So you could have said Happy Christ Merry Christmas and Happy New Year as well. <laughs> I was browsing one of my favorite thrift stores the other day and came across something that looked interesting. I wasn't 100% sure what it is at first, so I looked at the model number online and found out that it was a SCSI external hard drive designed for a vintage Mac. Yeah, sure enough, like I mentioned, it was. Of course, when I realized this, I knew the person who needed to go to, I bought it for $4. <laughs> I brought it home and to my surprise, it powered up and I plugged it in. The drive sounded like it spins up fine. What you'll find interesting is that's a five and a quarter inch hard drive inside, something I haven't seen in probably two decades. Yeah, these, these always had pretty large five and a quarter inch drives. It's probably 20 megabytes. Uh, right here it says 22 top on the, uh, there's a sticker on it, but I don't know what that means. He goes on to say the last five and a quarter inch drive he ever used was the Quantum Bigfoot drive. That was a terrible drive. It was five and a quarter inch, but it was like really thin. It was basically a way for Quantum to make a very cheap, cheap IDE hard drives to go into PCs when everyone had moved on to three and a half inch. And I guess they were reusing some old tooling or I don't know what it was, but those drives were slow and pretty terrible. This drive appears to be either 63 or 65 megabytes. Uh, conflicting information is on online. The faint sticker says X8928, uh, which I believe might be the day code for when it was made. 28th week of 1988. He goes on talking about, yeah, that it's like 1988 inside the case and stuff. Uh, he's including a four gigabyte Apple two and a half inch laptop hard drive he's had around for years, hoping to find a good home for it. It mostly still works, but has few bad sectors in the middle of the drive. What I've done is split it into three partitions with one of them over the bad sectors. So you can still use the first two gigabytes and then the 1.7 gig partitions on the drive. That's an old trick I learned years ago when trying to get the most life out of a dying hard drive. I find it amazing how much hard drive technology has advanced these last few years. And yes, I mean, of course, we're all on solid state drives now for the most part, but I did just recently buy around Thanksgiving a couple 14 terabyte hard drives and they were pretty inexpensive. I mean, they weren't like nothing. It wasn't like $10, but they were on sale and they were pretty cheap and they're in my server now for holding video storage and stuff. They're not super fast, but 14 terabytes. I mean, that's just, that's amazing, right? Thanks for all the interesting stuff you share on your YouTube channel. And I look forward to many years of watching you explore vintage technology. Yours truly, Matt. Thank you very much, Matt. Very nice letter. So very cool uh, old hard drives. So let's take a look at this stuff on the bench. A CMS external SCSI drive and an IDE laptop hard drive. Let's take a look at this CMS drive first. So I have the Stealth Classic 2 sitting here and that's because these drives are designed to fit underneath these classic Macintoshes perfectly. And it has a double benefit of not only raising up the computer for a little more ergonomics so your neck doesn't strain so much looking down, but it just takes up less desk space, right? And if we go back to the original Macintosh Plus, it supported SCSI external drives, but it did not have an internal hard drive of any kind. So you had to use one like this. Apple released a hard drive that looked just like this, but of course it was Apple branded and looking, and that was typically used underneath the original classic Mac. So lots of other companies like CMS here, and it did the same thing. Now, looking at the back of this hard drive, it has two of these 25 pin connectors, which is a little unusual. Typically they had a Centronix 50 pin, which was more standard for external SCSI drives. But uh, yeah, 25 pin here means it just uses a straight through cable on the back of the Macintosh. With eight dip switches on the back, it's probably likely that these first three are the SCSI ID 
And I don't really know what the rest do, but I would I would imagine that perhaps this last one, which is set right now, uh, it activates internal termination on this drive. I have plenty of 50 pin Centronics terminators, but I don't have any that would fit on this type of connector. So you do need to have the end device, the end connector terminated, which has resistors in it. And that just is there to prevent reflection of signals on the wires and stuff like that. Now, if it's a short run from the hard drive to the computer, you can get away with no termination, but ideally you really should have it on there. Now my SCSI to SD adapter, I have a DB25 on here, so I can use a, one of these straight through cables. So I'm just gonna borrow this cable off of here and we'll hook up this hard drive to this Mac, see if we can get it working. Almost certainly this hard drive would have come with a short cable just like this for hooking up to your computer because like I said, the machine is supposed to sit on top of it. It doesn't need a long cable. And we just hook up the SCSI cable just like so onto the back of the machine, tighten the thumb screws connect up the keyboard and mouse. We need a power cord for the hard drive. And I have this one to plug into the computer. First I'll power up the hard drive, see if it even spins. Actually that it's spinning just sounds very unhappy though. So I'm gonna say this hard drive is no good. Oh wait, maybe. Oh, it sounds, it sounds very bad. All right, well, let's turn the computer on. I have a feeling this hard drive is, is toast. What's interesting is how loud this is. And you know, I have to say, a lot of computer hard drives back in the day were really loud. And it's just what you put up with because you needed a hard drive and you had no choice but to put up with such horribly loud machines and fans and hard drives as these. It's just, you know, what could you do? Now I actually hear it accessing the hard drive right now. So that implies that perhaps this drive does work even though it sounds relatively unhealthy. All right, well, nothing has come up on the desktop. Let's check SCSI probe, which I think I should have in the control panel here. And there it is. It's a Seagate ST277N, which is actually not surprising at all. This is a five and a quarter inch, relatively large hard drive. I think it's, how big is this? 50 megabytes, something like that. I guess we'll find out in a second. Let's run Silver Lining, my good old favorite program here. Surprised nothing came up, but maybe whoever had this thing before erased the hard drive, which is the right thing to happen. Okay, it's making unhappy noises right now. So yeah, this drive I think is no good. Okay, there it is, 65 megabytes. Okay, so there are bad parts of the disk because it's making very unhappy sounds right now. So let's go to test and format here and let's try running a short test. There's no way that this drive is actually gonna work. I don't have an ST277 handy, but it looks just like this drive here, which is a 251. This is a MFM or it was a ST506 interface. So it'll have a different controller board on it, but the rest of the drive is basically the same. And the N variant in the model number when it has an N at the end, that just means it's the SCSI version which is what this is, which gives it some intelligence. That's why you can run these diagnostics and things like that. These diagnostic routines are built into the controller that is on these hard drives. It increased the cost, but it allowed you to hook up multiple drives and with IDs and you know, this is typically what Amigas and Macintosh is used. As I feared as well, the test has just stopped. It has six errors. And I think the computer just froze basically. I think this drive is toast but that is extremely not surprising. Essentially all of these hard drives back then, uh, these, these drives were just not designed to last and they all die. So if this had fully function, I'd be very surprised, honestly. Incidentally, I just rebooted this computer by pushing command, control, and the power button, and it rebooted the machine, which is interesting because I wasn't aware that any of the classic Macintoshes outside of the Color Classic, which I've been repairing on my Saturday videos, actually had that feature built in. This machine actually has a reset button right here on the side, but you can do it from the keyboard as well. That's pretty cool. I'm trying to run Silver Lining again, but it, it's making very unhappy sounds. So this, this drive is just, unfortunately, is toast. Uh, I think we're gonna have to crack it open and take a look inside and see if we can see physical damage on the disc. Let's run that short test one more time. 
and it really sounds unhappy right now. It's making this clicking noise. I have a feeling there's just something physically on the disc and the heads are hitting it right now as the disc spins, which probably is causing issues. Weird how there's no errors right here. So it's actually working. But once it gets to the seek test, we start getting errors right away. So yeah, no, very unhappy. Yep, okay, let's crack this open. Take a look inside. We flip this over, there should be four screws, and there are, this is very standard construction. All of these under Mac drives were very similar, except for the Apple one. I seem to recall that had a bunch of clips and things, but a lot of the other third-party ones, and if you had a Mac back in the day, you might have had one of these CMS drives or seen one of these CMS drives. These all were very heavy, typical metal construction. I'll just slide the lid off. And there's that ST271N SCSI drive. I know I had um, an external hard drive for one of my Macs that was this exact hard drive. I don't think it was CMS brand, but I know that the internal drive was the 271N. All right, so these are terminator resistors. That shows that this drive actually has termination built in. And it looks like this extra switch here is connected to something. There's a purple wire that runs off of it and it goes to something in these connectors here. So that could be, for instance, termination power. Like it gives five volts into the termination resistors. Not totally sure. I'm gonna crack the hard drive open. Let's get these screws out of here and take a look to see visibly if we see anything wrong in here. Obviously it goes without saying that if you have a hard drive you care about, don't open it. <laughs> I'm only doing this because this drive appears to be completely screwed up already, which is par for the course with these kinds of drives. It's very rare that that 251 that I showed, the MFM hard drive I have, I showed that that actually works, which is very unusual for these types of drives, I gotta say. All right, well, there's the innards. And I don't immediately actually see anything wrong in here. Everything looks okay. There's dust falling on it already. So I'm going to power this up and we'll see if we see anything visibly wrong here. All right, here we go. Definitely something wrong. Do you hear that scrapey noise it's making right now? That's the noise it was making when it was inside this case here. So that didn't come from me opening it. There's something on one of these platters on the very far edge there. Maybe that's where the head had been sitting for a very long time while it was parked. And that is gonna be causing problems. So when I turn it off, it should park the heads. And it seems quieter when the heads are in the middle there. But once the head seeks to this outside edge there, there is something wrong. <laughs> okay, well there's your problem right here. This was just sitting on the desk next to this uh, washer. That's one of the read right heads. It fell out of the drive. It fell out. When I took the cover off and I tilted this over, I was just trying to get these little washers off because these were on each corner from the screws. That read right head, that just sort of fell out and had just been sitting on the desk right there. So clearly it's not gonna work when you have a missing read right head, right? Now it may be difficult to tell, but the read right head on the top is sitting right there. So that one is definitely not missing. All right, so I'm holding the hard drive and have manual focus enabled. Do you see something that looks wrong there? There's a missing read head. It's the top of the second platter. It's just gone. See right here, there's the little wires that should have gone to it. And this thing is just sitting right on the platter. I could see the head there and the other two heads are there too. This head, not so much. So I think what can happen is those can get stuck on the disc media. And then sometimes when you power up the drive, it just rips the head right off. I know it's gonna be hard to see, but the disc media is very scratched right there where the head was gone. <laughs> so there we go, that hard drive, it's, it's not gonna work. 
And if you noticed earlier, this is the stepper motor drive. So this is a this is a stepper motor as opposed to a voice coil. These hard drives were very slow at seeking because you had a spinning, rotating motor to do it. Later ones use voice coils, more like a speaker almost, where it's, it can use high pipe current um, coils and it can move the head very quickly. But this whole assembly, very heavy, a lot of mass in here. So it's a very slow drive, but uh, <laughs> yeah. Hard drives don't work when your heads fly off. <laughs> <laughs> As for the laptop IDE hard drive, I connected it with a USB adapter. It absolutely works, just like Matt said. It does have a couple DOS or FAT partitions with one in the middle that says don't use, because he said there were some bad sectors on it. Now, luckily, this is just a 44-pin IDE drive. It would work in things like the Amiga 600 and 1200 and lots of laptops, early laptops and stuff. Luckily, I found a place, and I can't remember where it is, but um, it's on eBay and they sell new old stock IDE drives. So 44 pin drives, these are Seagates. They were really inexpensive. This is a hundred gigabyte drive and um, they're still sealed in the packaging here. Maybe they're refurbs. I don't know, it says warranty void there if, if broken, but I bought several because they were like $15 or something like that. And these are really quiet. They have good bearings. They don't make weird clunky noises and I've had no issues with them, with them so far. I popped these into old laptops that use 44 pin IDE and they work great. So yeah, luckily I have a good supply of those drives. So I don't necessarily need to use stuff uh, like this that has bad sectors on it. But hey, it's nice to know that it, it does work. Unlike this uh, Seagate drive, which has the basic equivalent of throwing a rod through the side of a block. If you know the car metaphor, through its rod. <laughs> Now, I definitely can still use this uh, CMS hard drive chassis though. I just can use some adapters to put a three and a half inch SCSI drive in here and it should work perfectly. So that's kind of cool actually, if I wanna set up a hard drive to use with the Mac Plus that I have, I have a Mac Plus, so this will be perfect. So sweet, thanks Matt for sending in these hard drives and um, I think it's always fascinating to find interesting failure modes like a ripped off head on a hard drive like that. It's pretty cool, so thanks very much. All right, that's gonna be it for this mail call video. I am noticing looking in the camera viewfinder here that I need some better lighting for this bench shot because this overhead light above me makes me look really washed out on my forehead. I mean, I have a big head and I have a big forehead, but the light <laughs> makes it that much shinier. So anyhow, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, I'd appreciate a thumbs up, but if you didn't, you know what to do. Hit that thumbs down button. Hit that subscribe button to subscribe to my channel. It really helps me out. And of course that notification icon to be notified when I upload new videos. Although I mentioned this last time that it really feels like YouTube never actually notifies you because I never get notified. So I can't imagine anyone else does either. Put your comments and your suggestions in the comment section below. And that's gonna be it. Stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Goodbye.